you mentioned earlier that part of the way that Hoover was able to wrest control and and make the FBI a powerful and threatening organization was to have dirt on politicians as well as these independent orgs. And I wonder if you've reflected on the kind of democratic one, the, the kind of like complete disinterest on the left side of the aisle for this committee, even among, I would argue, progressives who should have some understanding of the radical history that you just laid out and the, uh, or the history of infiltration of radical politics, I should say, that you've just laid out and the obvious benefits of having an investigation to an organization that overwhelmingly threatens and pressures the left. And frankly, uh, many Republicans, most Republicans are not Marjorie Taylor Greene who have an appetite for this sort of thing. And I wonder, do you think there is some of that going on as well as Marjorie Taylor Greene out here talking about abolishing the FBI because she is someone who is a relative outsider in this this realm or who just has an appetite, you know, it, it's such a kind of conflict and uh, messy, you know, conflict prone, messy person that she doesn't care about dirt on her. She has chosen a different kind of political path. I mean, what do you think is going on there? Where there, do, there does seem to be a genuine appetite for this, but only from right. a relatively few, a uh, relatively well, small number of people. Right. I mean, I think that the Trump base um, feels that, and I and I don't think they're wrong that Trump was targeted by the FBI. And Trump says this. I mean, Trump came out three days ago with an amazing. I thought little mini speech about the the what he called the national security industrial complex, and he was bragging about. It. He said, "I'm you know I'm the only president in, in generations who hasn't gotten us into a, a new war, and that's because I didn't listen to the bad advice from the generals and the State Department. Mm. And when I get reelected, we're going to clean house." And he names all the agencies that so we're going to we're going to go after them. World War Three has never been closer than it is right now. We need to clean house of all of the warmongers and America last globalists in the deep state, the Pentagon, the State Department, and the national security industrial complex. One of the reasons I was the only president in generations who didn't start a war is that I was the only president who rejected the catastrophic advice of many of Washington's generals, bureaucrats, and the so-called diplomats who only know how to get us into conflict, but they don't know how to get us out. For decades, we've had the very same people, such as Victoria Nuland and many others just like her, obsessed with pushing Ukraine toward NATO, not to mention the State Department support for uprisings in Ukraine. These people have been seeking confrontation for a long time, much like the case in Iraq and other parts of the world, and now, we're teetering on the brink of World War III. And a lot of people don't see it, but I see it. And I've been right about a lot of things. They all say Trump's been right about everything. So to some extent, they're taking cues from the leader of this movement. And they, they read the, you know, they read the press that the left doesn't read. And they see facts. It's also, you know, they go beyond that. And then there's crazy conspiracy theories and all sorts of stuff. But they're, but they're the, the people who are like, oh, wow who a year before the left or a year and a half before the left, like, oh, Hunter Biden's laptop reveals serious corruption. Whereas all of my left-wing friends, I mean, I'm talking about really intelligent, well-read people were like, if I brought that up when that first story in the uh, New York Post broke, couldn't even discuss this like you might discuss the weather. Like, hey, you guys see this news? Like, what do you make of this? It was just like, oh yeah, the laptop. Yeah, right. What are you like yeah. crazy? And it's like, yeah. Uh, no, I'm pretty sure this is real. And lo and behold, it is real. And only when, you know, the New York Post and New York Times in the spring of last year finally begrudgingly admit, okay, the laptop is real, do then my radical, you know, critical friends and 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 the general kind of media environment they're part of, can they admit that the that the laptop is real? But the yeah, laptop, the, the Washington Post, the New York, the New York Post, of course, is all over it. <laughs> right. The, yeah. And Washington, New York, not Washington, Washington Post and New York Times. Yeah. Admit it only a year after. Yeah. And the New York Post is censored by Twitter yeah. for running this story. And I mean, that you know, this constitutes election interference. Doesn't mean that the that Trump would have won the election had it not been for the FBI suppressing the Hunter Biden laptop story. But this what happens with that story is that Hunter Biden leaves his laptop at a Delaware repair shop 
And he signs a contract that says, if you don't come and get this in six weeks, you forfeit ownership. He doesn't come and get it. The owner of the repair shop makes numerous documented attempts to contact him and return the laptop. He can't do that. And so he opens it up and he's, we don't know what he's going to do, just snooping around or maybe he's going to refurbish it and sell it. And he realizes that this is the president's son's laptop and that there is never mind the crack smoking and the prostitutes in the fancy hotels. There is evidence in the form of emails and text messages and other documents of serious corruption that Hunter Biden was engaged in influence peddling. Let's talk about that piece of it, because I do think that so many liberals are able to be dismissive of this in part because they think the conversation is too focused on the kind of prurient interest in the drugs and the women and all of that. But that. Wh- while I think it would be it would it would benefit the argument that's being made to be very as specific as possible about the alleged corruption, because the argument, even people who are very open to talking about this say, well, it looks bad and certainly there is a suggestion and probably an obvious implication that if Hunter Biden's running around telling people, hey, work with me, I'm, I've got the president's ear, that, that is obviously a kind of soft corruption. But what, mm-hmm. what even folks who are very open to that say is, well, there's no red flag that would actually implicate Biden. There's no reciprocity on Biden's side. Hunter is selling his connection to Biden, but there's no proof that there was any quid pro quo actually that implicated the president. Well, Unfortunately, there there is. Uh, I mean, Joe Biden has said he never discussed business with his son, but there, we have a voice recording of Joe Biden uh, leaving a message for Hunter Biden about a, a New York Times story that could have been worse in describing Hunter Biden's dealings, his business dealings. And Biden's Joe Biden says to Hunter, he says, I, I think the story's OK. I wouldn't worry. I think you're in the clear. You know, it's not as bad as it could have been. Right. Hey, Powell's dad, it's 8.15 um, on uh, Wednesday night. If you get a chance, give me a call. Not, there's nothing urgent. just want to talk to you. I thought the article, at least the thing on online, is going to be printed tomorrow in time. It's good. I need you clear. And uh, anyway, um, if you get a chance, give me a call. I love you. That was Joe Biden there leaving a voicemail for his son, Hunter. The Daily Mail leaked the voicemail from 2018, where the president seems to have confirmed that he knew of some of his son's business dealings. The voicemail was obtained from Hunter Biden's laptop. Uh, so the idea that that, Hunter, that Joe Biden knew nothing about what Hunter Biden was doing is simply not true. Wait, wait, help me understand that. So you're saying that there was a, a time story about what Hunter Biden was up to and President Biden, Joe Biden reached out saying, oh, it could have been worse. And the implication is that he knows you you won't you wouldn't say that unless you knew the worst things. Well, it what it proves is that when Joe Biden says, I have never discussed business with my son, Hunter Biden, we have a recording of him saying that the story about your business dealings isn't as bad as we thought. So it's like we at least know that they they did talk about business. But here's here's an example of the kind of corruption. And, you know, I mean, what's missing on Hunter Biden's laptop, Joe Biden doesn't, you know, leave a voice recording or a signed message saying, you know, yes, I uh, I will do this quid pro quo. But Hunter Biden is h- hired by Bermissa, the largest natural gas company in Ukraine. It is under investigation by a prosecutor. Ukraine is one of the most corrupt countries in the world. I'm sure the prosecutor is corrupt. Bermissa is corrupt. Hunter Biden is hired to be on the board and he's paid a million dollars a year at 80, 83,000 and change a month comes out to a million dollars a year. And his mission is to make that investigation go away. And he does that by getting Joe Biden to visit Ukraine and pressuring the government there to fire this prosecutor. That happens. And Joe Biden then brags about it on camera, right? Saying that the whole thing is, you know, about corruption. I know we got rid of this corrupt prosecutor, but it's like, you know, um, I remember going over convincing our team, our <coughs> others, to convincing us that we should be providing for loan guarantees. And I went over, right, I guess, the 12th, 13th time to Kiev, and, uh, and I was going, supposed to announce that there was another billion-dollar loan guarantee. And I had gotten a commitment from Poroshenko and from uh, Yatsenyuk that they would take action against the state prosecutor, and they didn't. 
So they said they had they were walking out to press conference. Said, "No, nah. I said I'm not going to. We're not going to give you the billion dollars." They said, "You have no authority. You're not the president." The president said, "I said call him." <laughs> I said, "I'm telling you, you're not getting the billion dollars." I said, "You're not getting the billion. I'm going to be leaving here." And I think it was what six hours. I looked. I said, "I'm leaving in six hours. If the prosecutor's not fired, you're not getting the money." Oh, son of a bitch! <laughs> Got fired, and they put in place someone who was solid. And then at that point, Vermis was like, "Great job, job well done." And they cut Hunter's uh, remuneration in half. So it's stuff like that. There's emails where he's describing a deal. I forget whether it was with a Chinese company or a Central Asian company, where he's describing how the the proceeds will be divided, and it's like ten percent for the big guy to be paid to Hunter Biden. And Hunter Biden describes in his you know, in emails to his family, he's like, you know, when scolding one of his daughters, he says, well, I hope I hope you're able to support this entire family for 30 years the way I have. And, you know, the, the circumstantial evidence indicates that it's basically Joe, that Bo Biden was going to be the political guy and Hunter Biden was going to raise money for the family. And they all like living beyond their means. And they're all like, you know, lavish lifestyles and uh, and. Hunter was helping to. It's it's interesting because that. Joe Biden was always notable as one of the least affluent members of Congress. So what's what's going on there? Is he just really bad with this money, or is it because he doesn't have as much wealth as some other Congress members that he's more susceptible to certain kinds of? I don't know. Schemes, or a lot of this, or a lot of this goes on, and it just all goes unreported. I mean, you know, mm. um, the you know, I mean, there's there's your old colleague. Uh, rising Brian Grimm many years ago broke a story about the rate of return for members of Congress compared to the market. I mean, mm. members of Congress across the board make something like 17% on average on their returns. I mean, how do they do that? How do they beat the market like that? They do it through insider information, you know? Can yeah, we, can for sure. That? No, but it's like, come on. I mean, really. and, and another wonderful innovation from uh, the McCarthy uh, House is this uh, Pelosi Act, which is one of the most brilliant uh, acronyms I, I've ever heard. It's like a, it's a it's a stop insider trading act, but it stands for the they actually got the letters to spell out Pelosi. Oh, really? <laughs> you know, this one, funny. I should just I should just Google it because I keep talking about it and it's too good to pass up. OK, we'll we'll cut around this. It's. It's it's the Preventing Elected Leaders from Owning Securities and Investments Act. Sounds good. <laughs> Pelosi, yeah. Um, pure, pure coincidence the acronym works out like that, I'm sure. <laughs> um, so in terms of the the FBI and the Hunter Biden laptop story, because that's you know where, where we started with this, it's like, so this Mac shop owner is, he's freaked out by having this. He, his father, who lives in Arizona, takes a copy of the laptop's contents to the FBI field office there, and they reject it. They said, we don't want this, get out of here. Then in December of 2019, the FBI come to the shop and they say, we need the laptop. They take the laptop. At this point, somewhere along the way before this, um, or I don't know what the timing is, whether it's after that FBI visit, or I think it's when after the FBI reject, it's after the FBI reject the initial copy of the laptop, and then in, before they come and get it, that the Mac store owner gives a copy to Giuliani. And Giuliani's like, boom, this is the October surprise. You know, we're going to, you know, we're going to run with this. We're going to smash Biden with this. The FBI get this story in 2019. They, in, in early 2020, they start telling the social media companies and legacy media that, hey, there is a big Russian disinformation campaign coming and it's going to involve Hunter Biden. They don't say, hey, Twitter, you must under order of the FBI censor this story, but they don't have to because they like, you know, they create the context in, when, in which Twitter is then willing to censor the story. And so when the Post runs the story in September, then Twitter suspends their account and, you know, all of the mainstream media, you know, turn their backs on this story. So that is a form of election interference by the FBI. I'm not saying that Trump would have won had they not done that, you know? But it's like the FBI should not be doing stuff like that. That is political intervention. So, um, so it was done against. It was done against you know against the right in that case. But 
I think it's naive if the left imagines that such tactics won't be used against the left because they have been again and again and again, as you as you rightly said. It's like the vast majority of FBI repression of social movements and intimidation and frame up of political uh, you know, politicians has been against the left. You know, but they also go after apolitical people and they also go after the right occasionally and they, you know, they do their empire building. I guess what it feels like is that the FBI protects that institutional middle. And that it's not, I mean, to the extent that you might want to be tempted to say, well, to the extent that it's going after Trump, that's an outlier. Or that the extent that it's going, it's, you know, it, it, it feels as though the consistent thread is that when there was more of a real left in the United States, they were focused on the left. To the extent that the, the real left here that we've got, the AOCs of the world, are happily voting to increase funding to Capitol Police. Then the more the the outlier, the non-establishment actor is a couple of these fringe folks on the right, like perhaps Donald Trump and the mm-hmm. Boberts and the Marjorie Taylor Greens. And it wouldn't surprise me to find that they also are targeting those folks as well at some times. But here's the rub. A lot of folks are concerned that if there were a movement to abolish or significantly ratchet in the powers of the FBI, the authority of the FBI. That to the extent that Donald Trump has also been accused, potentially indicted of any number of crimes himself, that it would, in fact, let him off the hook. And the power, the problem has been that historically the FBI, these any kind of law enforcement institution tend to protect the interests of the affluent and powerful. They go after lower income, more vulnerable people. And that a world in which the FBI is handcuffed, is limited, is restrained at the very moment that it's set to actually go after a big fish for once is not in the interest of sub- substantive justice. So what do you say to those to, to that response? I think that's I think that's very short term. If 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 Donald Trump is uh, has committed crimes that are indictable. I, I don't think reforming the FBI is going to prevent that. If they have a good, clean case against Donald Trump, that evidence isn't going to be thrown out. Uh, if if it's concocted and it's through entrapment, then maybe it would be. But I don't think that's the nature of it. I mean, and I mean, I I'm suspicious that he is going to be indicted because we've been hearing this all the way along. And one response that progressives and lefties often give in terms of the Hunter Biden laptop story when they're forced to admit that it's real is say, well, I'm sure the Trump kids you know, are just as bad. Absolutely. I'm sure they are. And look at like, what, what's up with Jared Kushner's, you know, deals with the Saudis and all this stuff. But one thing about the Trump kids is they don't write anything down and they don't leave laptops <laughs> at stores. Right? I mean, they literally don't write anything down. You know, they, it's all on the phone or in person. And so I'm sure there is all sorts of corruption, but we don't have the evidence for it. And the more important thing is it's like, wait a minute, you don't get this opportunity very often. This is a once in a generation opportunity to try and rein in a really out of control set of agencies. And we know they're still going after the left, right? I mean, sto- this is in the article, right? The, the story that broke about the FBI infiltration of the Black Lives Matter protests in the Denver area. They sent in an Asian provocateur who got one activist convicted on gun charges was, you know, uh, was trying to get people to break windows and leading protests into traps. It's like, I mean, I, I doubt that that's the only example of that. You know, we don't have the evidence yet, but, you know, my, my suspicions are that they, the FBI were doing similar things to other Black Lives Matter protests. And, you know, I mean, they have just consistently targeted left wing movements, even other mainstream trade unions. I mean, it's outrageous. Well, what do we know about what they're doing with with trade unions right now? Because, I mean, that's it's that seems to me in some ways to be one of the bigger threats that the FBI poses. I mean, we're, we just came out off of this just r- truly demoralizing moment with the rail unions at the end of last year, where it seems part of part of the, the story that is a little under discussed is that apparently the union itself wasn't prepared to go on strike. So there's the piece of Biden crushing the strike of using this uh, 100-year-old um, Railway Labor Act to, to to crush their ability to strike, which was a choice. People act as though that was a fait accompli, that was a choice. But also that 
perhaps there wasn't more agitation around it because the the union itself knew that it wasn't actually prepared to go on strike. And I don't want to like jump to all of these conclusions and conjecture. Obviously, I don't know anything about the infiltration of whether it exists or whatever. But when you have moments like that and you know about the history of the FBI's involvement in union activity, it 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 makes you have, you know, there's a crisis of confidence in labor, which is what we in the left community kind of are clinging to as the last potential lever of power at our disposal. Yeah. I mean, we don't know, or I don't know, um, what the extent of FBI infiltration of unions is. You know, we, the only reason we know about this agent provocateur in Denver is because he came forward and this podcast called The Alphabet Boys somehow got all these recordings. So it's totally irrefutable. I mean, he's got the recordings of him uh, with his FBI handlers. But Th- these are the kinds of questions that this committee can answer because they can subpoena documents and they can subpoena people. And, but that's not going to happen if the left turns its back on it and if the left attacks it as the Insurrection Protection Committee. The left has to get in there and help shape this whole process and get, you know, get the fact that the left has been targeted out there and exposed. Um, you know, and it it is... I'm repeating myself now, but it is naive to think that the FBI, with its long track record of attacking the left, won't continue to attack the left. And it is naive to think that we can do this committee again real soon under conditions that we want. I don't think so. I think this is the time and this is the committee, you know, to mean, to paraphrase Donald Rumsfeld, when he says, you go to war with the army you have not the army you want. I mean, it's like you reform the FBI with the with the congressional subcommittee you have, not the committee you want. Yeah, it honestly makes me insane when I say, okay, Marjorie Taylor Greene, don't agree with anything that she says, but if we're going to ha- be having a conversation about abolishing the FBI or FBI reform, or we're going to get this new church committee, we might as well make the best of it. And there's a million bad faith attacks of, oh, you just love Marjorie Taylor Greene. You guys want to, you want to go have a tea party and have your, Stuff yeah, I mean, drink I mean, that's, or whatever. That's, that's terrible. And it's like this guilt by association logic is really bad. I think this is actually part of your the answer to your question about why is the left turning its back on it? It's like there's that history of being rightly terrified by the rise of these kind of right wing paramilitaries um, and, and demanding that something be done about that. And then once something is done about it, then we learn, well, wait a minute, they, you know, the FBI had them penetrated from the beginning um, or it seems they had them penetrated early on. Um but I mean, I think another problem is the culture of social media, that people do not think deeply about stuff. There is no room for ambivalence. There is very little room for curiosity. You're supposed to have total certainty, and come to conclusions quickly. And I've noticed again and again that part of what happens is people rely on guilt by association. They're like, mm. Oh, well, this person's crazy. The people sitting in this committee are crazy. It's like, Surprise, surprise, they're sitting in the House of Representatives. There's a lot of nuts in there, right? Hey, YouTube. Thanks for watching. Just a reminder that this is a podcast. You can catch an extra premium episode every Monday for $5 a month at patreon.com slash badfaithpodcast. That's patreon.com slash badfaithpodcast for $5 a month, an extra episode every week. Additionally, please do consider liking this video, subscribing to this channel. It helps us out. It helps independent media beat the algorithm. We appreciate you. And as always, keep the faith.